What's up, Freaks? It's your boy Marty here to introduce us rip of TFTC. Thank you for joining us. Give this video a like. Subscribe to the channel. If you catch us on podcast apps, make sure you subscribe there. Give us a rating, a review. Go to tftc.io as well. Become a member of the site. Join the conversation. Truth for the commoner. Trying to get you the high signal content in a world gone mad. This rip was brought to you by good friends at River. River's here to make it as easy as possible for you to buy Bitcoin and then take it into self-custody. Go to river.com slash TFTC, set up an account today, uh, and you'll get $5 of Bitcoin after you buy $100 worth of Bitcoin on River. You can dollar cost average into Bitcoin with no fees. Uh, if you're just buying one off, River has the best fees in the industry. Uh, they back all their Bitcoin reserves one-to-one in multi-sig cold storage. Uh, they highly recommend that you take self-custody. They just introduced limits. So if you want to set a limit order uh, below or above the current Bitcoin price, River makes that extremely easy as well. They also have real customer support. You can pick up the phone and call them if you have any questions about your experience on River. So go to river.com slash TFTC, set up an account today. Enjoy this rip. Okay. Gentlemen. It's been fun having you in the office for the last hour. <laughs> big fan of Paul Miller. Okay, yes, big fan of Paul Miller. Yeah, yeah, I'm as well. I think we could have sat out there for probably another a couple hours. We came to the right spot to to show off the daylight. There's a bunch of tech nerds in here. Yeah, that are always playing with this stuff. Yeah, it's just funny too that earlier today we were talking about ZapRite and the ZapRite people are right here. Yeah. So now, this is a this is a cool corner, catty corner to where we are at the Bitcoin Commons. We had the Austin. University, University of Austin, which is we call the Silicon Valley tech guys trying to create a new university. Yeah. Where are you at, Andrew? Uh San Francisco. San Francisco. Where the company's based. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> thank you for acknowledging. <laughs> Taking one for the team. And, yeah, I'm going to Costa Rica after this, and I feel like. What part? Uh, all over Nassara, Evita, Santa Teresa. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm partial to Hako myself. Really? How do you spell that? Uh, J A C O. J A C O. Okay, I might go there. Flyer Hermosa is a great, great yeah. wave. That's that's actually how I judge success for daylight. Like, where I can I work from Costa Rica and the company be successful? Why why is Costa Rica the barometer? I just want a place that has great sun, a free government, good soil, good food, animals. I love animals. Water, magnetism. Like you put all those factors together, it's hard to beat Yucatan, Peninsula, Mexico. El Salvador, Costa Rica, and maybe a couple other places. Yeah. That's what, uh, getting down to Hako, surfing Hermosa. Yeah. So my favorite memories are like coming out of the water after like a long session. And then they just have dudes chopping coconuts Mm -hmm. and like pouring them into plastic bags, which you probably shouldn't drink out of. But anyway, (laughs) you're parched (laughs) after like an hour and, uh, (sighs) you just got cold coconut water waiting for you. It's easy to be like just feeling good all the time when you're, when you're in a place like that, you're yeah. just like naturally outside more. And yeah, that's, uh, I think the key to a successful life. I try to sleep outside when I'm there. Ooh, mosquitoes yeah. don't eat you alive. No, no. The, uh, my uncle had a spot that he sold that was in, uh, in Hako, but you were we, like his back porch. You'd like go out there like 9 PM and all the stars would be out and you just sit there stargazing after a day of surfing oh, inevitably fall asleep and then wake up outside to the sun at like 5 a.m oh man amazing yeah daylight it's important hey, hey. How get long, outside <laughs> how long have you been on this journey producing what you were just showing us uh, uh, i started this summer 2018 in some ways feels like um i started this in 2012 when i first started having seasonal affective disorder but um the uh, actual, like, put my full time into it was mid-2018, and then the company officially founded on April Fool's 2019. So, five years. Hell yeah. From that. What's se- seasonal disfective order? Seasonal affective disorder affective stands disorder. for sad. It's when you get really sad in the winter months. Basically, there's a certain group of people that get very depressed in the winter months. And uh, just due to how dependent my physiology is on the sun, yeah. I'm not sure if it's like infrared, it's not the angle of the light, the amount of light, like it's still surprisingly complex, but uh, I get very, very depressed in the winters. And so uh, that's, that's where like going to Costa Rica or Mexico or something like that. Like I went to El Salvador within two days out of the depression, really? like two days. 
And were you in San Francisco at the time when you? Yeah, yeah. L.A., San Francisco. They all just don't. They're not close enough to the equator. They don't have the quality of the sun. Yeah. So on. Uh, so. Yeah, I experienced this. I got uh, somewhat hoodwinked into going to college in Chicago. Uh-huh. Went with my dad on a business trip in the middle of July. Oh, went yeah. to a Cubs game. <laughs> <laughs> there during one of the beautiful hundred days of summer. I was like, oh, I love this city. I'll go to college here. And then a uh, freshman year showed up in the sun that appears the clouds for 90 straight days. So I was like, what the fuck am I? Seasonal depression uh, is real. And you're just inside, you know? I mean, that's part of the, the big reason behind it, I think, is, well, for, for Anjan, he's, you know, you're in Canada. Yeah, so that's quite kind of quite a different environment than where your ancestors yeah, grew up, exactly. right? So complete opposite. And then we're just inherently spending no time outside when it's just miserable and cold and under all the artificial toxins inside. So I think there's a lot of gains to be had. This winter in Wyoming, and Wyoming gets cold. I did my best to try and like embrace the local <laughs> seasonal environment and I've never felt better. So Wild man. Cold what? plunged every day in the river, slowly turned the temperature in my house down one degree every day. And by mid January, um, it's like 48, 50 degrees in my what? house. And Wild I felt man. amazing. Because the thing about this, we live all year round at one temperature and we're so disconnected from our local environment. And yeah, we're inside. So that's the hard part about winter is like we're not getting enough energy from the sun. And then you couple that with indoor lighting and just indoor living, which is even less energy and, you know, less connection to nature. You're going to get depressed. You're going to, you know, and then we're eating foods and, you know, having temperatures that are completely misaligned. So I went full carnivore as well and felt amazing. Yeah. I was just thinking about, I spend a lot of my time in this office, in this small. <laughs> I was about room, to say, dude, office. come on, man! <laughs> I know fluorescent lights. Yeah, we try with uh, we try with this yeah, in the corner okay, here, okay. but uh, it's uh, it's hard. There's not that many good solutions, really, yeah, actually, right. and it's something you know, Anj and I talk a lot about. Oh, it's yeah. like we need to bring better and healthier, more sovereign alternatives across the board, and you know, the lighting space, the screen space, the tech space, massive gap still. Yeah, and that's the other. Uh, that's why I'm really fascinated about what you're building at Daylight because when you think about uh, screens in front of our faces all day, this is a relatively new phenomenon. Obviously, we had TVs for quite a while, but in terms of yeah, the smartphone, like, era is only what 16 years old now at this point. I mean, the LED is new too, so that blue light that you get is also a new phenomenon. Any any light. I mean, think of just yeah. light. Like the light bulb is what. 1890s we're, we're talking like 130 40 years in human evolution that's that's nothing and we've drastically changed our environment so much in the past 150 years and then the past 25 years 10 years with smartphones and technology really becoming the thing we spend the most time on i mean it's a completely different world mm-hmm. and our biology is not adapting that fast nor should it maybe no, it, li- it literally can't. We have <laughs> biology that's been slowly developed over the course of millennia. But it does. I mean, look at my pinky. That ain't straight. That's from holding my phone. Is it? My fucking, yeah. Most of us, our pinkies are slightly. Myopia. Yeah. Near, nearsightedness has become now probably the most prevalent health issue in the world. In one in generation, America, China went from 15 to 90% yeah, myopia. One generation. 90, nine, nine zero. 15 to 90 or 50? 15 to 90. Korea as well. Because we just one foot away, 2D. On screens all day. Screens. Because they have to read, you know, we have 26 letters in the alphabet. I hope I didn't get that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> they have like thousands. Mm-hmm. So they got to start studying way more at a much younger age, and they're doing it on screens. And so it just uh, fucks up your And they're not getting time outdoors, which you need to change your focal distance and stuff. So, so how did you go from realizing that you needed to control your physical environment? to focusing on a physical tablet to, to salt. Like, how did you go from yeah. my exposure to sunlight is affecting right. my well being to, I want to build a product that right. focuses on light exposure. Well, I needed like four or five things that all kind of triangulated into, into one spot. Cause, uh, 
I, I tend to doubt myself a lot. So <laughs> it's like I need I need like multiple things to finally hit me over the head and be like, okay, I need to do this. So I think one of them was exactly that. I was just like, I need to spend way more time outside or I'm going to be depressed. And I just got frustrated. Like I can't print everything out and I feel bad for doing so too and you're wasting it. And so I was just looking for, my life depends on a computer, email and writing things and reading things and doing all this type of stuff. How do I use a computer outside? So I try to like shelter myself or stay in the shade or do all sorts of things. Or I would just sit there and, you know, my iPad would die after two hours. I go charge it again and it'd die after an hour and charge it again. And I try all sorts of stuff. The one thing that like really worked is my Kindle. After college, I spent two years backpacking. I, I was disillusioned with Silicon Valley. I went to school in the Valley and I uh, was like, wow, this place does not give a fuck about people. It says it does. I want to change the world. I want to connect the world. I want to help people. It's like, no, dude, that's the shit you wrote in your admissions essay to get into Yale. And it's like, your friends know you don't give a fuck about any of that shit. It's that same energy. What, so, like how, so how would you describe the, uh, I mean, there's a facade of let's help the world. What's behind that facade? Yeah. And it's not a facade in the sense like people are evil. Like they're actually like nice, reasonable people. It's that like, it's that like McKinsey consultant energy, right? Where it's like, they didn't like have the, they didn't have the self worth or agency to actually do something. But they still wanted to please mom and dad and they still wanted to be successful and high status. So they do this like safe thing, right? And so it's socially safe to be like, I'm here to have impact. I'm here to change the world. Join my boring ass SaaS startup because I'm helping people, right? Like it's, it's this hope for receiving something from the other. And it's not, um, it's not bottom up. Like if you didn't get people to join your company, if you didn't get investors to rationalize investing in you, if you didn't get the regard of other people, they wouldn't do it. And that to me is the problem. It's not actually inherently flawed because it is. The flaw is it's done instrumentally. It's said to get something. And to me, like the real way you can have positive impact is when it's a side effect of you just doing what's most real for you. Yeah. Cause then it's ego less or less attached or. Yeah. There's like a, this formula that can lead you to making the world a better place, yeah. which is actually like, uh, maybe I get rich from this thing. Oh, I need to get into Stanford. I'm going to go volunteer in Namibia and <laughs> give people popsicles. That's why you should accept me to your university in med school. It's that energy. Yeah. You're still helping people, but like, come on, like, do you really even care? Well, that so, is, I don't, I don't want to be cynical, but to me it's sad because there's so many brilliant people who could be doing so much better stuff and we're being like channeled into these socially wasteful ways of being. So well, I know you say you don't want to be cynical, but I think we're at an inflection point where there's some much needed like cynicism in the sense of like just being upfront with people. Like this is not like we were talking about AI, right? Like look what like Google's Gemini, like all the AI engineers who are baking in, uh, <laughs> bias into their models and to mm. like, even the prompting and you send a prompt we're finding out that <laughs> the the llm is, has like all these queries are like all right i need to fix the prompt here here and here and give you this response that has nothing to do with the actual prompt you gave me we injected a bunch of this bias which is not um not truthful <laughs> at the end of the day and are you really helping the world if somebody's looking for particular answer and you're injecting your bias into it. Yeah. 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 I feel like the real truth is saying you're biased rather than pretending you're an Oracle yeah. and let somebody choose who they want to listen to. Yeah. Don't say, Hey, I'm the truthful one. Listen to me. Just say I'm biased. He's biased. He's biased. She's biased. You pick. Yeah. But I'm going to be honest about what I care about. Yeah. No, that's like what this platform is, is like right. particularly on the Bitcoin focus is like, I'm going to be upfront with you. Uh, I think Bitcoin is going to be the next reserve currency of the world. If I hold Bitcoin, that means I'll get extremely wealthy. If, the, if that happens, um, I do think it is the best money that's ever been created. Like I'm not, uh, I'm going to be upfront with that. Yeah. Like it is. This is my bias. I think the money's fucked. I think right. Bitcoin fixes it. Um, I am trying to sell you on this, but I'm telling you my bias. I went to Stanford because I was like, fuck, finance people, like tech people care. Now I'm like, dude, I love New York finance people because they tell you transparently about their self-interest. And tech people are like, no, I'm not doing this out of self-interest. I want to help people. 
I'm like, dude, just tell me you want to get rich. Like, at least we can, you know. I think that's a Northeast thing as well. That's <laughs> yeah. why I love, like, Martin and I get along. We grew up almost in the same area. And it's just honesty. It's brutally honest. And it's, like, proof of work, you know. Obviously, there's a lot of flaws with how the Northeast is run. But, I don't know, some of that West Coast energy is just yeah. a bit The Dutch a mentality, bit the Dutch are very honest, I guess. Well, that, yeah, that's why I learned. I'm from Philly. And went to college in the Midwest and then mm. um, moved to New York. But that's like one thing I noticed the Midwest people didn't get sarcasm, number one. But number two, <laughs> like blunt, uh, like telling people like what you think bluntly mm -hmm. is not a. Uh, is not received well in other parts of the country where like Philly, where I came from like a blue collar family. Both my grandfathers were union workers and um, had big Irish Catholic families and had a lot of successful uncles who went to Wall Street. And oh, wow. It was part of like <laughs> them just being blunt and all that. Um, it was weird when I, again, going back to it, like I think a degree of cynicism in terms of like world where the world is going, particularly from a, tech perspective like funneling us into this digital panopticon is necessary because if we keep going down this road without fixing the problems at the base layer of these technologies and the ethos that drives a lot of them we're fucked i've got two young kids and i mm. do not want them to live in the digital panopticon that censors their speech tries to censor their money and tells them what to think and what they can do throughout the economy and then it's on the devices that are simultaneously just robbing their frontal lobes of dopamine and shaping them in a way that's setting them up for being so easily manipulated. So it's almost, and you could debate whether it's by design or just evolutionary how the technology came to be, but it's a damn, you know, effective, you know, dual strategy from both the hardware and software perspective and the... I guess the social aspects, the s psychological social aspects of using some of these social media products. Yeah. I'm going to be up front. My name is Marty Bett and I'm addicted to social media. It fucking <laughs> attacks my dopamine uh, receptors very well. And as, uh, as somebody like I'm thinking about my own life's journey, that's why it's really interesting too. I mean, I'm 32. I got the first iPhone when I was 16 or 17. So for half my life, I've been connected to these smartphone devices and they've only gotten more addicting over time, which is now I have two young kids and trying to be cognizant of being a father and not being attached to my phone is something that's top of mind at all times. That's why I like working with this guy. Cause it's almost like, hi, I'm Anjan. I'm like you, like, I still suck. I still use my phone too much. Like I still eat at nighttime. I got a little more here than I need to have, but it's like the way to think about daylight is hopefully Unjin looks like Tristan, <laughs> feels like Tristan, <laughs> eats like Tristan a couple of years from now. That is the promise of daylight. And this is why you buy a daylight. Well, that's like, so. because that's the thing. These technologies are like double-edged swords. They're incredibly powerful mm. and make you incredibly productive as an individual. But then there's the completely, uh, addictive, unproductive side of it. And I guess that's the question is, are we in this period of time where we're learning how to play with this double-edged sword and create experiences that trend towards being as productive as possible? There's a, there's a beautiful quote by E.O. Wilson. He says, um, um, what characterizes the modern man is we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. And that's the key double-edged sword is if you want the power of gods, which is what technology is, you need the wisdom of gods. And that virtue ethics, that wisdom, that what you learn from elders, from grandparents, from parents, from, you know, whether it be church or your community or whatever it may be, that's just so lacking in the modern world. And so whether you're young or you're a parent or that, it's just we don't necessarily have the wisdom to handle the power of these things. And like we like to say, um, like the simplest example of wisdom is as a kid, you want to eat all your Halloween candy. Night mm -hmm. you get it. And your mom's like, don't do it. And you're like, fuck you mom, I'm gonna do it. And the next day you feel like shit. And then that tummy ache, that's wisdom. You're like, yeah. okay, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. 
I'll wait next time. I'll eat a little bit less. Right. And, um, I think wisdom is like getting a Thai massage, right? Where it's like you do it and do it. It is misery. I don't know if you ever got a good Thai massage, but that stuff hurts. <laughs> I have not. No, oh, man. brutal. But the next day you feel so good. Yeah. And it's like the wisdom trajectory starting out with tummy aches and going to Thai massages where you go from just indulging in what feels good in the moment and you feel bad afterwards to restraining in the moment so you can have a better, more sustainable long-term life. And I think that's hopefully what we can be doing is not necessarily just what we invent or contribute, but start creating and catalyzing a movement to enable there to be more wise technology, for there to be more wisdom in handling technology, for more technology to be in the Thai massage category rather than the tummy ache category. Yeah. Like we, we're trying to build Thai massage technology. I like that. Like that analogy. No, 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 when you put it that way too, it's like we are the generation that, whether we like it or not, like we, this has been forced on us to develop the wisdom to understand how to harness and use this stuff. It's so quick. Who, how, who, who has a chance to learn by the time you're on to the next thing, you're on to the next thing. This has never existed before. Is like, is never this amount of change that quickly, that deeply has access to our attention, to our children at all times. It has never existed before. So um, I think it's like almost a collective humility, which is like, I need to slow down and handle this power. And it feels like little boy energy is like, nah, give me more power. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Right. Until you die. Right. Or things blow up catastrophically. And so I feel almost like it's a, um, it's a growing up moment in every area of her life. It's like, instead of buying the $15 H&M thing that'll fall apart, like buy the natural fibers, cotton, linen thing that's like durable, sustainable, and feels good, right? Like we're just applying that same philosophy to technology. And so whether we start with a tablet or we make a phone or we do this or do that, I think what we always want to define ourselves by is not being a computer company, but trying to bring this like growing up to technology, however that looks. And what well, does look a certain way with the daylight tablet that you have <laughs> like what is it made up like yeah. what in your mind is like the optimal stack for providing the market with this incredible power but doesn't let them fall into the other side of the double-edged sword of addictive abuse of these technologies sure. and i'll try to answer your previous question about like how i even got going with this the basic idea is i was just super cynical about technology because i went to silicon valley i thought it was about innovation and impacting the world and it wasn't uh, that's what I deeply wanted to do I come from a family of doctors and something built into my DNA to want to like help people and that's a place where I get pleasure and uh, it wasn't that and so I was like fucking technology man it promises you the world and doesn't deliver on the bill of goods I had really bad eye strain I'm super ADHD so I'm always getting distracted i feel like shit when i use a computer i'm like i'm gonna write this essay and then three hours later espn i've learned how <laughs> manny pacquiao creates so much power with his left hook like what am i doing right i feel like shit because somebody's like oh you're gonna get that to me tomorrow i'm like yeah and then i'm like fuck it's like 2 a.m and i still haven't it's just that was my life and the seasonal affective disorder you know just i lived in fear of every winter it was, it was horrible i would get really depressed and so I was like, I wanted to do a fuck you to technology. Uh, I wanted to get revenge because it hurt me, my self-esteem, my actual physical health. I needed something that would actually allow me to be a little bit healthier because it was, it, was, it was really grim at times. And um, I don't know, I became fascinated with trying to understand like how humans work. And um, there's this concept called evolutionary mismatch, which is the way humans are designed and the way our modern environments are, are mismatched. Mm -hmm. And so the impulse to want to eat sugar is actually not a problem because in an ancestral environment, there was so little sugar, you wanted it to be like, if you saw some honey, you went after it because it's really high dense um, calories. It's just our modern environment has artificially over concentrated sugars and made them way too available. And so what used to be a feature is now a bug. And so, the basic idea is you can look at a computer from top to bottom and you can all the problems or a significant portion of them can be categorized as evolutionary mismatch. Your fingers hurt 
because your hands were never meant to be like this doing that. You were always like this, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's easy to get distracted because those red dots, that's danger. That's a berry that you need to look at. And they're utilizing the color red in a way to manipulate your attention. Little dings and dongs, that's also specifically sound engineered to take advantage of what's an orienting response for danger or stuff like that. Um, the fact that um, the light, the light is not natural light. The fact that it's unbalanced blue light, the fact that leads to circadian problems, sleep problems, metabolic health problems, dopamine problems, and even more, is because that's not how we were evolved. There was no random blue light at 9 p.m. blasting you in the face, right? And that's an evolutionary mismatch because no one, when they built computers, knew human physiology, mental health, evolutionary history, all of those things. And so uh, the question behind daylight, bringing all these threads together is, if you were to create a computer today from scratch and you prioritized it not fucking up an ADHD person, it not being so distracting, it not being so addicting, it not screwing up my physical health by forcing me to be indoors, if I could use it in the sun, if I could get rid of the blue light, if I could get rid of the flicker, what would that type of a computer look like? Um, and that is basically, even now, still the motivating question. If we were to redo a computer with our principles and um, be willing to compromise, so it's not some high, you know, highfalutin idea, but something that would actually solve a problem, something that would be useful to me, um, what would it be? And at the time, I was just reading so much. I read all these white papers. That, um, I still have an annotated copy of my original the Bitcoin paper that I printed out. That I spent really? like I spent like two weeks going deep on it. I like Googled every little thing. Yeah. So. Um, um, yeah, it was just like I wanted something that could help me investigate and learn deeply. And to me, a tablet is just a fat piece of paper. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a digital printout. And so that was the first product I pursued. It turns out it's actually the right way to build a new computer company. Because essentially everything else in computing is a permutation of a tablet. A phone is a small tablet with a, a radio in it. A laptop is a tablet with a keyboard attached. A monitor is a bigger tablet. You, know, you can kind of go down the list. And so it turns out it's so hard to do this if you get the sequence wrong, because every aspect of it is just insanely complex. No one has any idea how complex it is. And the proof of that is there's basically very few new computer companies. Like Oculus was the last new computer company, you could argue. And so the hope is um, make a healthier, distraction-free, sovereign computer that's immediately useful, that you can use instead of your iPad. You can improve your health, spend more time outside, eliminate blue light, get rid of eye strain and flicker and things like that. Um, hopefully it actually makes you more productive. Hopefully it upgrades your consumption. Hopefully uh, your kids don't get autistic or ADHD or all the, the, the impacts from that. And um, from there, we can make a phone with this. We can make a laptop. We can just go down the list of personal computing and do it with our value set. And hey, you may not agree with your value set and like, that's totally okay. Like our product is probably not right for my mom. Cause my mom's number one computing value is can I play Candy Crush? <laughs> <laughs> it's a black and white display. Sorry, mom. It's going to be hard to play Candy Crush. Right. So it's, that's okay that it's not the computer for her, but it's the it's computer for my dad. Cause he reads all the time and you know, the blue light affects him. And so quick break here, freaks. This rip is brought to you by gradually then suddenly a framework for understanding Bitcoin is money by Parker Lewis. I wrote the forward to the book. I'm honored to have done so because it's the best zero to one primer. If you're looking for a logical explanation of why Bitcoin obsoletes all other money, buy one for yourself and maybe a few for your friends. Go to the safehouse.com slash gradually. That's the safehouse.com safe spelled S A I F the safehouse.com slash gradually use the promo code TFTC for $5 off at checkout. Buy it now, freaks. The price of Bitcoin is going up. You need to understand it. This is the best zero to one primer. Back to the show. When it comes to the psychological effects of these products, and particularly when you're designing daylight, how much of it is the physical aspects, like the, the screen, the, the lack of blue light, the lack of the flicker, versus the actual operating system? Like how much of the design of these operating systems lead to the distractions and the tendency to fall prey to your ADHD? Right. right. It's a good question. The short answer is it's both. Mm -hmm. The longer answer is it is surprising how much of the problem you can solve if you do zero on software and just 
do the changes on hardware. Okay. So like we have, we're, we're still building it up, but we have two modes for the tablet for the operating system. You have kale mode and cocaine mode. <laughs> <laughs> so kale mode is totally locked down. It's only got, you can read on it, you can write on it, you can type on it, you can uh, you can take notes, you know, you can listen to podcasts, audiobooks, music, but that's like basically it. Cocaine mode, you can do whatever you want. It's got a browser, you can download any app you want. And so when I use our thing in cocaine mode, um, I'm surprised by how little like Twitter I consume on it. I'm like surprised by how little like YouTube I consume on it. Even if I have unfettered access to all of it. There's something about removing the flicker, uh, making it paper-like or reflective, where it doesn't feel like a computer. Um, if, we, if you spend more time on it, I think that might be one of the most interesting subjective aspects, is it feels more like a piece of paper or a book or looking at a dinner menu. It just doesn't feel like you're looking at a screen. And something about that, just like your brain is put into a new relationship with the stuff. Um, the black and white, uh, you put that at the lack of blue light. And there's like some interesting science around like the blue light is putting you in a particular low dopamine state and then you're craving it. So it's like the software is supplying what the hardware is trying to like take, take from, from you. you. And um, yeah, I wonder if there's like know. this also like, I mean, it's becoming uh, really in your face now, literally with uh, Apple's new Vision Pro. <laughs> uh, but like it does the blue light in the screens that have become normalized over the last 15 years. Like, is there something subconsciously where we think we're like observing another world that is somewhat addicting? Cause it's like completely foreign. And the fact that a daylight screen looks like a piece of paper or something in the physical world <clears throat> does something subconsciously where since it's like, I don't know if I'm describing this right, but like since it's like in our physical world, it's not as doesn't pull you in. Well, I think the further we deviate from nature, it's like the more stressful that environment is for us. And the repercussions of that over a long period of time is just damage, whether that's eye damage, you know, whether that's, you know, mental health issues from neurological damage, psych psychological issues. Because if you're in this constant state of stress, your body is not gonna be able to handle that over a long period of time. and. It's really that simple. I mean, all we're trying to do is better emulate the natural world, having a light spectrum that is more, you know, similar to sunlight or, or having technology that brings you outside. You know, that's, you know, something Anja mentioned multiple times, but that might be the most important aspect of our, of our company, of our products is that you can get the benefits of being outdoors far easier while still being productive. And that's to me, one of the biggest detriments is that we live indoors and you know, then you're more susceptible to like seasonal affective disorder. You're more susceptible to all these things because the main energy source, the main environment that our biology is tuned to has been stripped away and replaced with these, you know, artificial items that are completely different. Like the pulse nature of light. I mean, that's sending your brain and your eyes in a frenzy and you can't even see it visibly but it's there, you know, hundreds of thousands of times per second, these LEDs are switching on and off. That doesn't exist in nature. That doesn't exist. And we have no response other than that, other than high stress to that sort of environment. So, and you wonder why people are just walking around on edge all the time. And then like Ancha said, we're just fed into the social media aspect. And then it's like, oh, like, you know, we're, we're so primed to be held captive by those types of uh, applications. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned the getting outside to use these devices. I think of in the summer, I go to the beach in the Jersey Shore. In my room has a deck out back and it's facing northeast. So I can't work outside until it's like 10 a.m. because the sun rises <laughs> in the east. And then like if I try to work out there with my laptop, the glare is so bad. And even if I put my laptop facing east it's just not worth it um so something as simple as that like being able to get outside a couple it. hours earlier um, and actually work on the back deck which is much more preferable to the kitchen <laughs> and, I, and i think what's cool about these is these principles are transcendental like even what tristan's talking about like the light on your macbook the light here they're all fake it's an illusion 
they look like they're constant light, like what you get from the sun, but they are literally switching on and off like 200 times, like 200,000 times per second, more or less. Because the way they change the brightness is they change what's the percentage of time it's on and off. And so you, this is crazy. People don't realize this. If you <laughs> shoot it in slow motion, you'd see that be like on for like two milliseconds and then off for one millisecond and on for two milliseconds and off for that. And then the illusion, because it's happening so fast, is it looks like it's at 60% brightness. And then if it was on for three seconds and then off for 0.1 second and on for three seconds and off for 0.1, it looks like it's at 99% brightness. And that's literally how they change brightness by changing the illusion. I had no idea. That's how it it's works. crazy. Nobody knows this. And so when we say flicker free, our thing is a light is a light is a light. It's just a light. It's just constant. Now that's considered an old technology because every led is slightly different, you know? And if you do it the flicker style, when you go to 10% brightness on one tablet and then another, it'll be the exact same. With ours, 10% on one is going to be slightly brighter than on another because every LED is slightly different. It's like what uh, the truth with like like real organic produce, they're all kind of different. It's only the, you know, the f like factory farm GMO stuff where everything's the same. And so we're bringing that same principle here is like that's an illusion. There's this convenience and this sameness and this like, I guess it works. And it makes the engineer's life easy. It makes the supply chain easy. It's an illusion. It's not real. That light is not real. And so how do you reset a computer? You got to start to what's most real. Like if you're going to decentralize things, you need to centralize around transcendental truths. Whether that's devotion, whether that's light is light, or even color. When you're looking on your iPad or iPhone and it is purple, it's not actually purple. It's a little red, it's got a little green and a little blue in such a proportion. And because those little red and green and blue are so small, when you look at it from distance, which is what you're doing, it looks like a purple dot. There is no purple at all. And so color at the deepest level when it comes to computers is a fucking illusion. That's pretty crazy. I didn't realize that either. <laughs> Holy shit. So when you see purple in nature, it's actually purple. Sure, you have rods and cones, and there's some principles that are similar, but the fact that these you get these peaks that are different. And so, um, yeah, when you think you're looking at something, you're actually looking at a green peak that's like this and a red peak like that, and it then your brain interprets that as, okay, it's yellow. So it really is all fake. Yeah. <laughs> and so in a way, <laughs> even if black and white seems like a reduction... To me, going back to something real, even if it's smaller, is better than having everything, but it's all fake. Mm -hmm. So, and so our thing that's is, is real. When you're looking at it, it's real. Yeah. Um, so, how hard is it building a hardware company? Oh, don't do it. <laughs> don't <laughs> I mean, do that's it. one don't of the, the most tried and true truisms of the modern day. Is like. You, like you said, don't do it. You get highly advised not to get into hardware. Oh, yeah. I mean, just like start stacking up the great filters. Like hardware company, already super hard. Make that like a consumer hardware company even harder. Then do it in a category that has the world's biggest companies as competition. Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Google, like even harder. Create your own custom component tree. Like even somebody like Oculus, they just use off the shelf parts. They use cell phone displays. They use lenses that were used for other stuff. We actually invented our own display technology. That could have been a startup in itself. We didn't need to build the software and the computer around it. Even harder. The last time there's been a new display company was in 2008, Pixel Chi, and they went bankrupt, right? So you start stacking all of this up and you just end up with like zero minuscule odds. You look at some of these other hardware companies that got funded, often they had a rich dad or the person had a track record or they funded it themselves, uh, whether that's Framework or Remarkable Tablet or Skydio or something like that. It was my first big, you know, first real company. So. how to get this far? <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> With all those odds stacked, yeah, I mean. Yeah. So what was like the process? Like what, what was like the first physical piece of hardware that you yeah to figure out and build on top of the truth is i think we made it because um we got really lucky like super lucky 
I could just rant for 10 minutes about all the insane coincidences that had to happen. I, 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 I'm very interested to hear okay. about these insane I can, coincidences. I can, I can bring up a couple of them. <laughs> I think I have a high pain tolerance, mm. so I think it helps that I didn't give up. Um, and I think... Um, I think just starting from principles. Like, I wasn't chasing a trend. I wasn't trying to do something that was this. So there's something about if you can stick it out long enough, like, and you're right about this as the, the principles that others also care about, I think it starts to cohere. Like, other people want you to succeed. It starts, to, like, other people want to help. Like, I think the reason we got investment is because um, folks were like, I think I'm going to lose every dollar I put into you, but uh, this is the computer I want for my kids. So if nothing else... I'm paying $100,000 to get my two kids a computer that won't kill them. And so it was stuff like that along the way that uh, made a huge difference. Yeah. What's, because I imagine we're building this from scratch, new components, the supply oh, chain yeah. is not as robust, but. 2018 until 2021 to make the first working prototype. Yeah. Oh, just uh, horrendous. One of those uh, primordial things, like, oh, what's going on? I know. I feel like it's such a contradiction. I'm like, distraction-free <laughs> technology. And I have two phones in my pockets. And I don't know. My sperm count might be low these days. Yeah. But all that, like, what's, like, how is it uh, on the supply, ch supply chain side of things? Oh, I mean, that was one of the hardest parts of this is, like, um, if, you make, if you want to make a new display, you go to these guys. They first say, get out of here. And you, 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 you try long enough. And they say, okay. We could do it, but your minimum order quantity, i.e. the minimum number of screens they'll make is 500,000 units. Hmm. And you're like, okay, $200 times 500,000 units. Where the hell are we going to get that much money? And this is why nobody can ever make a new screen. Because it turns out making a new screen is like the worst industry ever because there's no way to prototype. The effort it takes to make one screen is basically like 97% of the effort to make like 1,000 screens which is like 98% of the effort to make 10,000 screens because it's actually the same process as if making a new chip. Mm -hmm. And if you know anything about making a chip, that is expensive and complicated. A screen is just a big chip. It's actually worse than a chip because with a chip, if some of the transistors, what makes up a chip doesn't work, you kind of route around it. You're kind of like, okay, we don't use that guy. We do this and that. On a screen, if one pixel is dead, even a four-year-old kid would notice it. Mm -hmm. And what that means is you can't make mistakes. And what that means is the manufacturing process has to be insanely dialed, which means they're going to be extremely conservative. Yeah. So. No, I mean, that's something we deal with a lot in the Bitcoin mining industry is focusing on TSMC and Samsung. Mm. And I know way more about <laughs> renting foundry space than I ever thought I would <laughs> 10 years ago. And so it's similar to that in the screen space. Where exactly. You need to rent. So you're like, hey, I have this idea. Me and a Japanese professor have worked on this for years. We have a, Here's a working prototype. We think that this could be really helpful. Uh, we always pitch them, like in Asia, they have so much myopia. Mm -hmm. So we're like, this is a myopia-free computer. We think that's appealing in Japan and Taiwan and China. Uh, hopefully, it's obvious, too, that there's a market for this. And... Um, could you make it for us? And they go, okay, you're going to buy 500,000 of these when we make it for you. And you're going to pay $20 million up front to develop it. And we're like, uh, yeah. <laughs> and that was me for like years. And then uh, it was just a super lucky coincidence, both in the industry and in me meeting the right person that somehow allowed us to strike the, the deal of a lifetime. And so on the supply chain side, that was the, the most crucial thing is, our display manufacturer is willing to have our first batch be a thousand units. Really? Yeah, and we need to do twenty thousand units at the minimum. Otherwise, they'll cut us off. But uh, twenty thousand units instead of five hundred is why any of this is possible. I could have had all the same people, all the same ideas, and none of it would have worked. What you know? pushed them to be confident to allow you to do this? Oh man, <laughs> it's a story. I mean, do you want to hear it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so there's one, there's only two manufacturers in the world who can build our technology. They're both Japanese mm -hmm. and one of them went bankrupt. So there's one, I spent a year with the one that went bankrupt and I was like, oh shit. Okay. This is not going to go. So the other one uh, told me in the beginning that they're, they're unable to make this display technology. I was like, there's no way you guys, I've like, I know my research. I've read the papers and everything. And so I spent years 
every three months being like, Hey, do you want to see the thing? Do you want to time? I just like, and they would just ignore me or they would just say like, no, we can't do this. I went to Japan. I was supposed to meet one of the, he was an alumni from my school. I was supposed to meet him for an hour. He left after like six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> he was just like, kid, get out of here. Like you're not going to be able to do this. Do you understand how difficult it is to make a new screen? Um, but the core idea was basically I was able to resurrect a really old screen technology that was completely thrown out into the dump that a bunch of random Japanese professors had spent like 30 years sitting there whacking away at the flaws with it. There was a birefringence problem. There's a parallax problem. There's a dichroic dye, you know, just blah, 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 all material science. And then like in 1998, they had a breakthrough in 2003, they had a breakthrough in 2009 that, you know, it was just like random, but it was one of those things where the difference between having a bridge that is like 99% complete and 99.9% .9 complete still is zero because you can't cross that bridge. Yeah. Right. But you get that final brick and then you get the, you get the credit of all of it. So it was like this technology was just like solving flaws, but it was never getting there. And so, um, I just got super lucky. I found this Japanese professor's research. One of the papers that was the final kind of plank to complete the bridge came out in December, 2018. I started in, you know, July, 2018. And so I was just deep in the research and I was like, whoa. And I put it together with a couple other papers and all of them collectively came out in 2015, 2018, 2012, earlier, kind of solved the key problems of this technology. And so um, I started working with that professor and some reason he was open to work with me. I didn't have any money with him. He just wanted his life's work to make it into the world. So I spent time in Japan and over COVID tried to do it all remote. It was insane. And we finally, uh, fall of 2021, had a working prototype that showed that we could make this kind of um, fast refresh rate, uh, reflective paper-like screen technology. And... Um, I would try to show it to the manufacturers and they just wouldn't bite. But I finally, finally got lucky in early 22 where I emailed the guy. I said, guy, just throw me a bone. There's a display conference coming up soon. Just like, give me like two seconds of time. And he's like, okay, dude, like, I don't know. He, God bless him. If it wasn't for the random people here and there that decided to do the right thing, like none of this exists mm -hmm. for whatever reason, he always wished he was an entrepreneur, but he was too scared to do it. He decided that he's like, you know, this guy has the balls that I never had. I'm going to support him. So um, if it wasn't for that person, none of this would, would, would be would, would be here. And uh, so we went there. We got our two minutes to pitch. All these Japanese people did all these nods and then just like ushered us out. And then uh, I don't know one of the women there wanted to be nice. And they're like, here, get some cookies and some bottled water. You know, it, this was at a display conference. And so we're sitting there. And we're just like trying to eat as many cookies as possible because we're like broke, you know? Mm. And um, believe it or not, the next customer that was going to see the display manufacturer was Tesla. Huh. And if you know anything about cars is they went from having like no screens mm -hmm. to cars today are like covered in screens. So out of all areas, this is the ones that the manufacturers, because their sales were crazy during COVID and then it crashed and they were desperate because they already own their factories, whether their factories are at 90% utilization or 20%, their cost is basically the same. The marginal cost is nothing. So they're desperate for any incremental demand. And so like getting Tesla is like the biggest deal for these guys. So it turns out the top, the top of the top people of this manufacturer were there for that Tesla meeting. And uh, they came over to get some water. And uh, me being my precocious self, I started a chat the dude up and it turns out he's the CTO of the entire company. And the most insane coincidence is I uh, took the prototype out of my pocket and showed it to him. And he started asking about it. He started, and I was like, how does he know so much about this? It turns out the Japanese professor whose paper in 2018 was this dude's student. Oh. And he was actually at that same university 30 years before innovating some of the foundational technologies that made these guys the only manufacturer who could do it. And the fact that his student was the person who made the paper, who's now a professor that made this possible, just felt like the most insane synchronicity. 
And um, uh, the reason this manufacturer could do our manufacturing is because some of his stuff, he came up with this cool thing called micro-reflective structures. And it was like his life's work in academia before he went to the commercial side. And he had found there was no practical use case for it except our thing. And so he is like, oh, he might be able to bring my life's work into the world. And so he, uh, he, he, he like talks to me for like 15 minutes. And then I ask him, you know, would you be able to build this for me? Would you be able to build this for me? And he turns around and there's all these Japanese people, like 25 of them. And they're all like, <laughs> and he goes, what do you think guys in Japanese? Like, uh, I learned this afterwards. Like, what do you think guys? Do you think we can build this for him? And I didn't realize this at the time, but culturally when the Shogun, the big boss says something like that, like you have to say yes, or you lose your, or you he loses face. So by putting them all on the spot in front of me, he forced the guy who like runs the division to say yes. Holy shit. And if that didn't happen, even if they were interested, it would have been like, a 12 month, 16 month process. That's how bureaucratic they are. And so they had to say yes. And then for the next hour, everybody's clambering around, losing their shit, being like, holy crap. Like CTO San just told these guys that we're going to build this for them. Like what the hell? <laughs> and then the next three months was just this insane mad dash. And the whole time, the guy who ran the division hated us. <laughs> Cause he's like, I never got to choose to work with you. And so there's some other stories about the way that, you know, things got messy and this and that it's a, it's a fun story. But if that didn't happen, if I, if we didn't like sit there and try to like scarf down more cookies, if I didn't take that prototype and show it to the guy, if somehow the insane coincidence that the dude who was the CTO of the company was a professor of the professor that made this possible, None of this. If happens. Tesla didn't have, if a Tesla meeting. didn't have a meeting next, if that guy didn't have us go right before Tesla, so honestly, it's like it's when like, people say like congrats or like good job on the success. Like I just think about all of this and I say, dude, this is out of my control, man. Yeah, the universe wants it to happen; it'll happen. If the universe wants it to fail, it'll fail. Like we're just along for the ride. So, well, that's the one question I have. Like this is something that's been worked on for decades. The yeah. CTO started. Yeah the project seems like as an academic so was all this growing research over the decades purely an academic endeavor yes, yes. yeah because you have the proliferation of the incumbent screen technology exactly that you do today yeah it was purely academic yeah it's because there was no use for it mm -hmm. and you go talk to any of these experts and that's what was my interaction in the beginning you go talk to them they're like oh it's a dumb idea because of xyz dd i'm like well this paper says that's not in this paper and they'd be like yeah, but you know, da, 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 da. and I'm like, wait, you're not giving me specific arguments, right? So I sat down and I was like, okay, problem one solved, problem two solved, problem three solved, da, 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 da. And in that 2018 paper, I was like, whoa, problem three and four are solved. Like, damn, that's enough. And so it's like, there was people who believed in this and they kept at it in 2005. Some of the crazy folks kept at it in 2010. But like at a certain point, you're just like, dude, what? it's been 20 years. Like this thing is done for. And so society has no good way to look at things that have been bad ideas for a long time that suddenly become possible, mm -hmm. right? And there's great analogies to, to different, you know, Bitcoin or other crypto things as well. You know, Schnorr signatures and RSA and things like that have been there for a while. So, um, yeah, I just feel like sometimes uh, it, it all comes together at the right time. If I started this in 2016, I'd be screwed. Yeah. If I started it even in 2020, I'd be screwed because I timed it right because all these manufacturers, they make a lot of money on LCD displays then Apple decided to change some of the iPhones from LCD to OLED. And in one day you lost hundred million mm -hmm. units. So they're like, what do we do with these machines? And we just got really lucky that our screen technology can be manufactured on LCD machines. So these dudes are like, dude, we just lost like 70% of our business on this. It's free money for us to make these guys a screen on this because otherwise there's no business for that. Everybody's switching to OLED. That didn't happen they wouldn't have worked with us. There's no way we're getting, you know, 20,000 MOQ. So. Yeah. And going back to like this being an app, it was an academic problem for a while, uh, working towards a solution. Like what was like the CTO from the company that eventually manufactured these screens for you? What was his initial, like, if we can solve this problem, here's what 
it will enable for the. I world. think it was more academic. Yeah. I think he's like, "Ooh, cool optical effect with sub wavelength," you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's called meta materials. Mm -hmm. So I think it's. Uh, I think it's so cool that it wasn't that they had an idea of how it can be useful. They were more like, "This is really cool," and hopefully one day it's useful. And it's kind of fun that that that's how it led to this stuff. Yeah, and then you're just eating cookies. You're like, "Yeah, I think it could be useful." Yeah, uh, we just put all these things together. <laughs> Yeah, that's crazy. The snickerdoodle did the, that's the trick, you know, when I was eating the chocolate chip, it didn't really work, but the snickerdoodle saw the future. <laughs> that is, uh, that's an incredible story. <laughs> I should show you a photo. I probably can't see it on camera, but, uh, I, I, I didn't think I was getting anybody's time at this event. I, it was like, there's no chance that, you know, so you should see the way I dressed for this. So. <laughs> <laughs> that guy <laughs> look at the way i'm dressed <laughs> you look like you look like you're coming from silicon valley <laughs> oh come on man i tried so hard to be different <laughs> wow it turns out i'm the same that's amazing and they were just laughing their ass off because everybody else is wearing suits and shit and they're like this guy looks like he's yeah, they're, they're pretty formal over there oh, they're like so very formal. traditional yeah mm. that's amazing yeah no it's uh i've never been to japan Oh, go. amazing. Amazing. Yeah, I think I totally like worth it. it. Yeah. Yeah. They they have an interesting dynamic, right? Because, like, financially, they're running, like, the highest debt-to-GDP ratio <laughs> in the world. But they can somehow have a very structured organ. It's, it's kind of like everyone's <laughs> on the same page. With What's the, the honor culture? culture? Yeah, exactly. The, the, the um, I forget who I discussed this with. It had to be, like, six months ago on this show. But that's what... People always point to Japan, they're debt to GDP. They were the first yep. country to really embark on quantitative easing, like monetary policy in the 90s. Uh, and they still have, a, compared to the US, like a high functioning society in the sense that the gap between the rich and the poor isn't anywhere as pronounced as it is here. There's not as many homeless people. It's very clean, it's clean yeah. very tidy, efficient. Um, and while we have a similar financial predicament here in the United States, like the, the social outcomes completely different because of, you know, they have, they have, they have culture. It. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, seriously, like, I think that's a very underrated aspect of it. And yeah, we don't have anything to cling on to anymore. It's also like, go back to the Northeast, like versus like maybe the rest of the U S the West is like, like you're saying, you're brought up an Irish Catholic household and you know, a lot of other similar families, like you feel a big draw to that. Like you would fight for your community mm -hmm. and now that's been absent for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's not a, you know, a, a strong foundation anymore when that gets kind of ripped away. No, no, it's a big problem here. And I think it all comes back to the money here in the U S at least. Um, all of this. Yeah. yeah. Even the tech, right? Like, we, we just had lunch with Jimmy Song. The first time I talked to him, he blew my mind on just like tying that all back. It's like, if you actually think about it, there's been no innovation at the tech level, really, like compared to what there could be. Mm. And like what Andre's saying is like, there were all these great leads people gave up on and then they just went with, you know, what the popular choice is and what worked and what was exciting and pretty. And then, I mean, what innovation has Apple really had in the past 10 years? They're kind of just fiat farming on the monopoly they have. So there's no incentive for people to really have a disruptive company. Or yeah, and I feel like Apple, all the major giants, particularly in hardware, have gotten complacent. New iPhones are... Like, Their like, innovation is VR. Public companies, man. Yeah. yeah. They got moms in Jakarta, Indonesia using their iPhone. You think if you try to totally reinvent the thing, they'll understand what's going on. They're just captured, you know, they're yeah. so big. And if you meet people at Apple, they're actually brilliant. They're creative. They read similar books to us. They just can't do anything. Yeah. And so I think they're waiting for initiatives like this to be a better f uh, channel for their creativity. And that's what I like to say. It's less that we're innovative about technology that I think made this possible. It's more, we were brave about values. Mm -hmm. I think if Apple or any of these guys wanted to do what we're doing, they could do it. They have a thousand, I go to the display conference, the entire thing is covered in Apple and Samsung people. They could do it. Like as much as I feel like I found a cool little glitch in the matrix, like maybe they wouldn't have found it, maybe they would. But I think the real thing was I spent the time to look because I was so convinced health matters. I spent the time to look because I was so convinced realness matters. I spent the time to look because I was so much in pain. 
And I feel it was validating my experience and validating my values enough to actually bet my life savings on it, to bet all this time. I think that is the core thing that drives this, not some genius technical insight or something like that. Mm -hmm. No, it's funny to go back to uh, the facade of value-driven initiatives in Silicon Valley, like Apple with like the Apple watch. Like we care about your health. But it's like, it's, here. it's, what is it? It's like greenwashing for, for health. You know, it's like, Oh, the new Apple watch <laughs> the has rings. A, I completed yeah. my rings. If you, uh, you know, if you have a heart attack or fall, we'll call 911. It's like, okay. But like, you know, <laughs> you could be the reason for that heart attack or like the decline of my health over <laughs> like a multi-decade <laughs> decade period, but they're never going to admit that. Right. Like how can they just go back and admit they're like, yeah, sorry guys, their screens are actually like, you know, lowering your dopamine and, you know, ruining your circadian rhythm, <laughs> your sleep, which is yeah. you know causing premature ch chronic disease. So, um, but we got these better ones now, so don't worry about that. It, it, it can never happen and they don't have to. And, it's a perfect timing, not only from everything in Anja's story and the company's story, but also people are waking up, right? Like people are becoming aware. COVID was extremely helpful. Huberman has 20 plus million, you know, followers and tens of millions of listeners. And he's talking about light. He's talking about the importance of sunlight. Um, people are distrusting the organizations and centralized authority giving health recommendations. Why? Because it's not fucking working. And then because of the age of the internet, we can actually go back and see undeniable proof that, you know, the sugar industry funded this and, you know, the American Heart Association had this conclusion because of this funding and all so much research. You just go scroll the bottom of the paper it was paid for by by parties of interest and you know after the vaccine rollout and big pharmaceuticals like people are just distrusting that at an all-time high and then you couple in the data privacy of like google and apple and facebook and people are they're hungry for something else but there just hasn't been anything yeah and like it's almost beautifully poetic how like the idea of the the uh, innovator's dilemma, it comes into play. Cause like, you can imagine well where, like you just mentioned, people are becoming hyper aware of how technology is affecting our health, how food's affecting our health, how medicine is affecting our health. Um, and going back to your point of like bravery, like having the balls to actually go do this. Like if you're Apple, tr trillions of dollars of cash just sitting there. Like if you had the bravery and the will to stick your neck out there and say, Hey, it's pretty clear that we're all becoming aware that this is affecting us negatively. Like we're gonna provide products that take us in another direction, in a healthier direction. They probably have a lot of success, but it's too bold of a move for them. And hey, we might still have egg on our face. Like we might be wrong and we we still may fail. I think there's still a good chance of that. The, the record for computer new computer companies is low, but I think it's fine. Uh, I took a swing on something I believe I can never be, I can never, go wrong that way you know, if we fail. And so um, I think it's kind of cool to build a company not from a place of fear. <laughs> how, okay, not leaning into a place for fear. I was gonna say like, how could you guys, how could you see uh, daylight failing? What is the avenue to success for you going in the other direction? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think the biggest one is just, it is so expensive to get something new into the world, especially when it's like a new computer screen. Like once again, they want you to sell 500,000, there's scale. If you're trying to do 20,000, each thing is gonna go up the wazoo. I still don't know how the price, we got the price we did. It's expensive, but our price is high, 7.99. It's a premium product, same price as an iPad Pro. You could argue what's the price of your health, this is cheap versus all the metabolic health, ADHD medication and all that stuff. So like I think, if you look at it the right way, it's totally worth it. It's a steal. But if you look at it from a different way, yeah, on paper, it's expensive. And so I could see a lot of people resonating with their mission, resonating with their vision, being super into it, but struggling to get out of the frame of my iPad Pro 729. And it does so much more. And so I think if we run into that psychological frame and that philosophy, I could see us getting a lot of attention, but not converting enough into sales. Let's say we only sell 10,000 of these our manufacturer cuts us off and then we're done. There's only people in the world that could do it. So it's like, goodbye. And so that's why I like to, I like to appreciate folks like yourself 
because it is you going out of your way to educate and pioneer people think differently act differently like these different philosophies these different psychologies you know more time massage less tummy ache if it wasn't for you folks leading that and educating no one's going to buy our thing why would i pay more money for something that doesn't have fucking color wait why would i pay more money for something that's bl- like that does less what you're telling me it does less and you want me to pay that much money the only way we can start this different philosophical thing is if there's people who are actually pioneering that and educating people so well that was cool to see you guys walk in and you interact with paul and tony because they're e-ink nerds that really think about this stuff and like they're like the prototypical archetype of your end consumer who's like i want this and compared to i don't know it shouldn't you had a competitor's product out and you were comparing the the reaction right. time and it's night and day and that may, like just from an objective product comparison like if you can compete on that little reaction time what you lack in blue light flickering you make up for and being able right. to react faster than the incumbent products like that's a leg up that i could see people easily forking up money to get access to and that's just the product level right? like i think we're a success when we have tens of thousands of people coming on board you know supporting us for the greater mission, the greater vision, right? This is just the first product. We can do so much more. Like we, we want to do so much more. We just need this to be a success. And then we can go do that. We're, we're probably, you know, the only company that's making computers, handheld devices, that's actually prioritizing the health, the sovereignty of the end user at the very first step of our product development. You might be convinced that other companies are doing that and they're not. And if you really buy into that vision, you know, that we're admitting, yes, screens are harmful for our biology. Yes, being indoors all the time is harmful. We want to bring you to a place that's better for your entire well-being so that you can succeed. Because if, you know, that allows for better, better productivity, better mental health, you're going to become a better person. And with the amount of time we're spending on devices, to me, that's like the it's invaluable right and you would want such a mission to succeed i i mean that's i literally dropped everything i was doing because i was like this is the most important company in the world to succeed if we actually want to have a better future a better alternative and we, we can only i was on his podcast yeah <laughs> he calls me afterwards he's like we need to talk <laughs> i was like we're talking tomorrow like there's no choice because i would drop everything i'll sacrifice all my time so that we have a better future for the next generation and we talk about you know children just thinking about them because they're so much more susceptible to the harm so what sort of future do we want to create and it was impeccable timing because if you know this was five years ago, even with all the screen technology breakthroughs, not a podcast, people, not a you know, we wouldn't have this conversation. We wouldn't have the support from this community. They wouldn't be as aware. And, you know, it's coinciding with a lot of the things you talk about freedom tech, you know, Bitcoiners supporting that we now have like an upper hand in actually having some finances, some money that's hard so that we can support better technology because it is expensive. It does take a ton of effort. And that's what a real success looks like for us when we get a big community supporting us and behind us, because then we can go and do whatever you ask for in terms of technology. Yeah. That's like how you want to, like, that's how a product should grow at the end of the day too. It's like organic Mm -hmm. focus on a community that gets it, aligns with it. It's asking for it, have them battle test it. Like, all right, here's what we need iterated on and go get it in the hands of the rest of the world. I mean, you can either have the ghost of daddy, Steve jobs and Cupertino telling us all what we need and want, or we can build it ourselves, grassroots, bottom up, learning from each other. And you know, there's always a push and pull, but uh, bottom up and top down. But uh, yeah, it's like decentralized to me is about taking responsibility mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, decentralized health to me is crucial. So you're not reliant on somebody else who gets to decide the life of you or your child. Get back to better food, better water, get back to the sun, get back to grounding and all the different things that can just contribute to your health. And we've talked so much about making the hardware real again, right? That's our goal is to make computers real again. 
So this illusion machine, the, an illusion of productivity and it just distracts an illusion that it's fine and it's doing all these weird you know, flickering the lights and the blue light spectrum. But the possibility is because we have our own computer, we control the entire software stack. And so the possibility of what comes afterwards is what you were talking about is what is a real OS that respects your attention, respects your time, doesn't try to hijack you, look like? What is a real OS that has real software built in? Hardened software, secure software, privacy, peer-to-peer -peer protocols, Bitcoin things, Noster, Lightning, so on, so on, built into the OS. And we're not Apple. We don't got shareholders that we owe a 30% app store tax <laughs> on, right? Our business model could be cash flow and hardware. And so we can have these free app stores, these web apps. The apps can be composable. They can, we can build these things in. We don't need to have Apple Pay. Happy for it to be all Lightning or whatever it may be. And so... That is the optionality we get to if people trust us and like our hardware. And I think that's just a magical opportunity because I can't think of anybody else in the world. Oh, you got the Solana phone or whatever, but <laughs> why would you buy it, right? And so hopefully we're providing enough of a differentiated reason for you to buy this over the a Samsung tablet or an Apple product or in complement, right? You, you know, when the sun goes down, you put away your MacBook and your iPhone, you take out this thing. So it's your wind down computer. It's the only, it's, it's the first thing you see in the morning rather than your iPhone and so on and so on. That's what I need. Um, is I get into my, I write often, not as often as you say. Like Google docs, like typing or like write with a uh, or something. Both, but predominantly for the newsletter. Yeah. In ghost in the oh. publisher. Oh, you gotta try our thing with a magic keyboard. Yeah. Well, my, it, my writing flow yeah. these days is between the hours, like 10 PM and 12 PM. So I'll mm -hmm. write, I'll send it out. I'll get the dopamine hit of like, oh, I think I just read something cool. And like, it feels good to like publish it. And then I get the wind down of like, yeah, I've been staring at my screen for three hours and I can't fall asleep. <laughs> we should get him one with a, yeah. with a keyboard. Yeah. yeah. It'd be super interesting to see how it fits into your workflow. Yeah. Cause that's uh, something that, again, going back to the double edged sword, like I would not be here for right. not leveraging this right. to, get the message out none of us <laughs> we didn't have these fucking blasting lights in our face for the yeah. podcast like um and i can feel it again especially since i have a four and a two-year-old now the four-year-old especially like it's becoming very obvious like oh shit he's looking at everything i'm doing and um i right. do not want to pass on mm. the bad tendencies of being fucking on my screen right and, but that's the opportunity we have for ourselves, right? Mm. We've gathered this knowledge, we've gathered this mindset. Now we can go and create that best world for the next generation. And right. that's like thinking extremely low time preference. That's what Bitcoin enables. And that's what proof of work is really all about. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for building this, honestly. Um, Cause there is like a set, there is, you can go, you can talk about cynicism earlier but there's also like this sense of hopelessness that exists out there like uh, mm. we're doomed to the financial not the financial the digital panopticon and we're beholden to the uh, the whims of apple and google and um amazon you name it and that's sort of the world we live in and the way it's going to be um, particularly in hardware like it, it has been hard to see any i mean you, you mentioned Oculus, maybe purism, something that people would point to, but they just went bankrupt. <laughs> like, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, the, uh, and so it's it's something that needs to be done. And like you said, it takes a lot of balls because it's a Herculean effort at the end of the day, a true hero's journey. But it's worth it, I think, for the, the health and sanity of society because these things are literally driving people insane. I was telling you, I'm trying to get off I haven't been using social media as much because it's just like you go on there and say, like, holy fuck, everybody's going crazy. We need to turn that narrative around. I mean, there is optimism. We can create better alternatives. Yeah. yeah. You just don't want me to read that yeah. last page. Of, uh, <laughs> Let's read it. So the book's called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And the basic idea is so much of modern the modern world and technology is... Um, too much of a good thing is a bad thing, right? And uh, I think that's what a lot of technology today is. It's like junk food tech. It's uh, 
super normal stimuli. It's hypersaturated. It is all the sex appeal. And then you're amused to death. You're stimulated to death. And so let's see if I can find this. God, I hope it's not like ending it on a negative note or something. No. It's like, well, this has been great. Okay. Look, and how's it been staring at that screen all the time? <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> Poor guy. All right. We need to make a monitor. All right. Yeah, yeah. Dude. The possibilities where we can take this. All right. Can I, can I go? Yeah. Okay. The book's called Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman. Okay. It starts. We were keeping our eye on 1984. When the year came and the prophecy didn't, thoughtful Americans sang softly in praise of themselves. The roots of liberal de democracy had held. Wherever else the terror had happened, we, at least, had not been visited by Orwellian nightmares. But we had forgotten that alongside Orwell's dark vision, there was another, slightly older, slightly less well-known, but equally chilling, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Contrary to common belief, even among the educated, Huxley and Orwell did not prophesy the same thing. Orwell warns that we will be overcome by an externally imposed oppression. But in Huxley's vision, no big brother is required to deprive people of their autonomy, maturity, and history. As he saw it, people will come to love their oppression, to adore the technologies that undo their capacities to think. What Orwell feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no reason to ban a book, for there would be no one who wanted to read one. Orwell feared those who would deprive, deprive us, Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much that we'd be reduced to passivity and egoism. Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Orwell feared we would become a captive culture. Huxley feared we had become a trivial culture, preoccupied with some equivalent of the feelies, the orgy-porgy, and the centrifugal bumble puppy. As Huxley remarked in Brave New World Revisited, the civil libertarians and rationalists who were ever on the alert to oppose tyranny failed to take into account man's almost infinite appetite for distractions. In 1984, Huxley added, people are controlled by inflicting pain. In Brave New World, they are controlled by inflicting pleasure. In short, Orwell feared that what we hate will ruin us. Huxley feared that what we love will ruin us. This book is about the possibility that Huxley, not Orwell, was right. Peace and love, freaks. Okay.